and uh, Mahika is going to be second, Rocky third, and we'll just jump right in. So I'm going to introduce Julia. We'll introduce each one before they speak uh, so you'll know about them. Okay. Julia Magnus, she is an environmental and animal law attorney based in Illinois. She is the founding member of uh, and general counsel for Chicken Roo Crew, a female-led rescue education and advocacy group for, for roosters. The Chicago, did I say, I think I said Chicken Roo Crew, I meant Chicago Roo Crew. Maybe I said it wrong. Anyway, Chicago Roo Crew, which is really cool to say, Chicago Roo Crew helped facilitate the placement of 114 birds seized from a cockfighting ring in 2019. They've rescued and placed countless dumped roosters, worked with city legislators to combat a statewide, uh, to combat a statewide rooster ban, and have worked on multiple other cockfighting busts and cruelty investigations. We are excited to have her. Go ahead, Julia Magnus. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. Unmute. There. So I'm unmuted now. Um, my problem is that I am not able to screen share and I've got some like really cool video and pictures to share with y'all. So yeah, Julia, Julia, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we uh, we need to switch you over to the um, the host controls. Thank you. So, so you can screen share. Can you do that, Hope? I sure can. Yep. And awesome. Then I can talk in the meanwhile. So essentially, you know, our group is a female led group. Um, we don't have a traditional sanctuary. We, what we do is we operate as rescuers and we have multiple foster homes within our group. And we have people who have you know, six to nine roosters in their homes at any given point in time. Um, all of us hold as many birds as we can at any given point. We get multiple calls weekly with respect to dumped birds, um, mostly roos, mostly in poor physical condition. So those birds, we bring as many as we can to the veterinarian to get treatment to get names and to get um, forever homes that are going to be um, justice for them, you know, the, the best landing possible. So in the process of doing that, we have been very grateful to work with and get to know Chicago Animal Care and Control, which is, uh, you know, our municipal shelter in Chicago. They have the toughest job in the city. They have to take every single bird, every single animal that comes through, um, and then they have to find places or make tough choices. Chicago Chicken Rescue is actually a sanctuary within our city, and we do have that sanctuary, but they're flooded, as you might imagine. Um, many of you spoke to backyard chicken issues. Um, we also have larger relationships further away from Chicago, including Farm Bird Sanctuary in particular, which is an, an incredible, amazing group. Uh, we're in, yeah. We lost you, you your, your picture. Uh, and there's some kind of a, a gentleman pick, picking up in your picture or something. Oh, that's probably my partner who's trying to figure out this mess. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Um, I figured that's I figured that's who it was. It's it's kind of a neat a neat. Uh, uh, oops! Here's Cosmos. He helps. <laughs> He's part of this whole you know thing, but yeah. So this is what we do. Um, so you know, what I really want to talk about is not so much backyard chicken farming because everybody has spoken so eloquently about that before me. So what I want to talk about is, you know, um, the cockfighting bus that we've participated in and that we're really proud to be a part of. So, yeah. Um, can you see that? Okay. We can so, see. So you can see me, but basically what I have to discuss is, um, on June 7th of 2019, 
114 birds were seized from alleged cockfighting ring in Chicago uh, by Chicago Animal Care and Control. So at that point, we had been working with them for some time. Uh, we, we, were, we were constantly getting calls about dumped roosters that they had picked up, et cetera. Um, and we were working with Chicago Chicken Rescue. So when we got calls about birds, you know, we would work together to figure out how to make that work. So we forged really friendly relationships with staff. Um, we, they were really interested in the birds and how to handle them and how to learn how to deal with them. So when that call came through, the trucks that picked up those birds uh, went directly to Chicago Chicken Rescue and they pulled 26 birds that night. Um, the next day, uh, we had, I don't know, you know, so many rescuers through our group come through and help try and triage and treat and place these birds. So, you know, I don't know. It was a really dramatic, horrible day. Like these birds were extremely traumatized and stressed out. This is not showing up at all on, okay. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, that was, that was pretty rough. Um, what I will say is that, you know, we had a lot of people come through, especially Quincy Markowitz of Farm Bird Sanctuary, who set the standard for how to triage and treat birds in this situation. It was, it was really tough, but every single bird in that shelter that day got hands on them, got treated, got triaged, their issues were identified and Quincy took the sickest birds. Um, the video you just saw was video from a Chicago Roo crew member, Lucy Milling, who then took the six sickest hens to an emergency vet straight away. So yeah, what happened after that was July 21st was Liberation Day for us. Um, here you can see on the left, you can see Andrea, who is our director, pulling all these birds and then all the empty cages. So that's kind of an esoteric picture for a lot of people, but for me, it's extremely meaningful that there were two pavilions of birds. There were two pavilions of of roosters and chickens that were just in terrible condition, just looking for homes. And this day, those empty cages signified their, their next steps to liberation. Um, so those photos obviously, you know, came from CACC step. And how did we do this? So, you know, the, this, this, we didn't do this. We did this with a lot of help. So we did it with municipal animal shelters, with law enforcement, and I'll get back to that, but like vegan in animal sanctuaries such as Farm Bird Sanctuary, Chicago Chicken Rescue, and Save the Gallos that took so many ex-fighters and had the expertise to deal with them. Um, these were some of our partners. I can't, I wish I could, I could spend an hour just listing all the people, but yeah, so th those are those partners that I wanna thank. Um, another thing is that we uh, set up a protocol for how to deal with this. So, you know, this is um, maybe it's a week later after the seizure. So it was, um, what? no, um, it was a week later after the seizure. And this was video taken by um, Chicago Animal Save. Can you, can you, can you turn down the volume? 
turn it down all the way. So all the way. So yeah, these, these, this footage is basically of multiple groups. Uh, it was Safe Humane Chicago, Chicago Animal Safe, and our own group coming together and trying to document. And the main point of the whole thing was to give each of the remaining roosters uh, like a sense of individuality, um, to like give them names, to assess each of their conditions, to, you know, do the best that we could to like kind of create a profile for each one that would make it easier for them to be adopted. Um, so that's kind of what we were doing here. Um, but again, like it, it couldn't have been done without the help of multiple groups. Um, you know, that bird, Catalpa, was adopted by a Latinx family. The father in the family used to live in Mexico and rescue birds from cockfighting rings and rehabilitate them. So, you know, that bird uh, went to a home. He was ultimately pretty much a house rooster. Um, but we did, we did give every single one names. We gave them all a profile. We gave them all, you know, um, just a general sense of personality that we could share um, with outside people that could consider adopting these birds. So, yeah, I, there was also another aspect of this whole thing, which involved law enforcement and which did um, involve like the documentation that we took at this time. So, you know, what's really important here is for as an attorney, like I've always been looking for a way to see how to apply uh, Humane Care for Animal Act standards within Illinois to farmed animals. And in this particular case, we managed to get it done, which is pretty cool. So actually, um, yeah, the next um, piece of this is um, the Illinois Humane Care for Animals Act, which um, I've only included a few provisions here. I can't really get into a lot of the law around it without, you know, taking a lot of time. But, you know, meaningfully, animal, the definition of animal excludes, um, does not, well, does not exclude farmed animals. Um, it means every living creature, creature. So, you know, when it comes to humane care standards in Illinois, in theory, um, the standards of that law apply. There are exceptions to various different um, standards, but when it came to animal torture, um, this standard was applied to these chickens. So this particular rescue was really important from a legal standpoint because it did involve the application of what would traditionally be considered to be a companion animals protection act to chickens and the alleged um, operator of this cockfighting ring did get charged with felony animal torture as well as cockfighting. So that was, you know, pretty big. Um, you know, I want to quickly like kind of talk about the inspirations behind these things. And for us, it's not even, it's, it's about the individuals involved. And so here you're going to see um, one of the um, roosters who was rescued um, being seen at Niles and his name was Freddy. Um, he is still part of our world and he's really great. He's such a good bird. Um, he did have a lot of trauma, a lot of stress. Uh, this is this is video courtesy of Lucy who brought him there. He was missing an eye. His feet were really messed up. Um, he now lives with a rehabber who is a non-vegan, but who really knows how chickens work. 
So you can see here that he is dealing with him, you know, just dealing with his own trauma and his understanding. He doesn't run from the bird. He doesn't, you know, fight the bird. He doesn't yell at the bird. He just tolerates the bird. Um, and I can't, you know, if you, if you look at the um, latter part of this video, which I'm trying to make happen right now. Hey, Julia. Um, Julia, this is how we'll see that, you know, that particular bird was capable of actually being close to a human. Um, and Julia, wow, this is, yeah. Julia, this is Hope. Can you hear me? There, yeah. Julia. So, yeah, that was cool. One more minute. Need to wrap it up. This, Thank dude. you. Did you hear me? Uh, yeah. One more minute. Just wrap okay. Up yeah. So, yeah, the last thing that I need to really talk about is just our mentor and our, um, our friend who was Dr. Peter Sadek, Sackis, who died on uh, March 31st. Um, you can see him on the left, you know, looking up the butt of actually another ex-fighter who came from a second bus that we helped it oversee. And then, you know, my main message for rescuers is you have to come to the people um, the same way you come to the animals. You have to have fun. You have to love what you do because if you love what you do, then it's not a job. Um, it's just really just spreading love to the universe. Um, Dr. Sackis ran marathons as well. So, you know, this rescue work is a marathon. Um, it's not a race. It's, you have to just like hang in there, keep strong and give love to the rescuers. So. Thank you so much, Julia. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Justin. Yeah, thank you, Julia. I, I really appreciated that. And, and I did follow the story of Dr. Sakas and it was, it was a really sad situation. Um, so, but I know all the, all the amazing work that he did. So, um, wow, thank you, Julia. That was, that was awesome. The work that you all have done for helping roosters in Chicago is just unbelievable. Um, and shout out to Quincy with Farm Bird Sanctuary as well um, for all the, the hard work that they do. So um, I want to go ahead and introduce um, our next uh, panelist, who is uh, Mihika Gupta. Um, Mihika is a gender fluid Indian American chef, artist, and community organizer. For the past seven years, they have been a part of various human and non-human justice movements. Mihika uh, formerly lived in Philadelphia and now is living in Kentucky uh, with their companion chicken, Corey, who was liberated from a slaughterhouse in June 2018. Together, they attend protests, marches, and community gatherings to advocate for both human and non-human liberation. Currently, they are working to bridge the food inequality gap um, in their neighborhood, or formerly were in Philadelphia, through a new plant-based food business. Uh, please welcome Mahika. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we awesome. can. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, so thank you guys so much to just to start off to have me here. Um, honestly, I don't know how I made it here today, but somehow I made it and I'm glad I'm here with you guys. I know that Rocky and Justin know a little bit about like how my life totally turned upside down in 2020. And just a couple of minutes ago, I was texting Justin my updates for my bio because literally everything in my bio seems completely different now. But um, I don't know, Justin, if you had reached out to me about this event when I was in India or coming back from India, but- I don't know, um, 2020 is all one big blur, so. Yeah, <laughs> but- Basically, at some point I had said yes to this and I was like, hopefully in the future of September, my life will be better and I can do this. But yeah, so I used to live in Philadelphia. Now I recently, uh, last month, moved back to Lexington, Kentucky, which is actually my hometown. I lived here for 18 years 
And for many reasons that I'll get into in a bit, I was out of here at 18 and now here I am back. Uh, in addition to Coretta, the love of my life, I also recently adopted two um, young Cornishes. Thank you to Rocky. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking a little bit more about them too. I do want to show a presentation a slide. So Justin, can you show me again? Or can you make me host? Oh, I'm already host. Okay, yep, awesome. Just did it. You're good. Okay, good, good deal. So I'll uh, share my screen in a sec. Um, but goodness, where to begin? Uh, I guess I just want to acknowledge that being an activist throughout the years, uh, like you know, Julia said, it's it's a marathon. You you go through so many changes in life, and you know being vegan and the journey of veganism, you change so much over time, like where you were when you first turned vegan to one year into veganism to then like five years into veganism. Like you're, it sometimes seems like you're a completely different person. And that's kind of similar to how my activism was. Um, Julia's story honestly was so heartfelt and it really uh, got me kind of emotional talking when she was talking about cockfighting and it, um, kind of uh, put me back to a memory I um, remembered from when I was 16 years old, actually. And uh, my very, very early activism years to when I was still living in, in Kentucky. And at 16, I had just gone vegan. And like, you know, I was a new animal rights activist in, in, in high school. And I remember one day um, basically convincing my parents that I needed to skip school to go to the capital, Frankfort, Kentucky, to attend Humane Lobby Day. And so I felt like such a badass junior, like, you know, fuck my AP test, fuck my advanced classes. I don't need to do that. Like, I don't care about pre-cal. I'm going to this Humane Lobby Day. And I don't know how much you guys know about uh, the state of Kentucky, but um, we have been historically ranked to have some of the worst um, anti-cruelty laws for animals, obviously. I think a couple years ago, I read a statistic that Kentucky was ranked the worst state for animal cruelty laws um, seven years in a row. And that was several years ago. So I'm sure it's been more years since then. But I remember going to this Humane Lobby, get, Humane Lobby Day um, in high school and um, immediately realizing that I'm in the wrong crowd. So as like a 16 year old little Indian girl who just turned vegan, loves all animals, I found myself in a room full of like about like 50 or 60 middle-aged white women who run like all these different like cat and dog animal rescues and just love cats and dogs to the ends of the ends and that was like honorable but um the, all the other animals that we're you know we're talking about especially chickens were nowhere to be talked about or cared about in that room and um I remember attending the kind of welcome seminar about Humane Lobby Day. Today we're going to be lobbying uh, for this bill that makes dog fighting illegal because believe it or not, I think there was like 58 states or 59 states in the U.S. had dog fighting criminalized in some way or the other and Kentucky was one of the ones that dog fighting was still basically legal. Um, so I was over there trying to fight for dog fighting to get dog fighting um, criminalized. So I made my little flyers. I was going talking to my legislators feeling so cool. And then I remember being told that like there is an amendment that was added to this bill. And when you are talking to your Senate, your uh, legislators, tell them that we don't want any amendments added and they should vote for this bill, like Bill 408 or whatever, without amendments. And I asked, what, what is this amendment? And the amendment to the bill was that um, when it talked about like fighting, using animals for fighting, they would uh, remove, I think it was like remove the phrase four legged animals to basically include uh, chickens and roosters. So in my mind, I was like, yeah, we should amend this bill to remove four-legged. So two-legged beings would also be included in this, duh. But it, unfortunately, and in reality, I learned a little bit about politics that day, that that was a way for basically to kill the bill because 
no Kentuckian legislator apparently would vote for a bill that was against cockfighting. And in my heart of hearts, like, I was put in a dilemma where I was like, how do I say that I don't want this amendment that would also help like chickens that I love and care so much about um, at the price of like this bill dying. And that day, uh, the woman who led that or that kind of event told me you shouldn't let a uh, perfect get in the way of good. And that is why we need to uh, promote this bill without amendments. And that was one of the, the first moments as a young adult where I realized that I'm in the wrong crowd over here because like I'm here for a whole different kind of liberation, not that stuff. But yeah, Julia, your story really reminded me of that, of just kind of like my early activist years and realizing that like, you know, like we have to stay strong of the vision of this marathon and not settle oftentimes and kind of like dilute our uh, morals, you know, for what would work at, at, at the level that we are at. Fast forward to moving to Philadelphia. The story I want to tell now is the story of how I met Coretta. So I'm just about to share my screen with you guys. Also, Justin, please keep me on track of time because I meant to put a timer and then I totally didn't. I, I have a timer running. I'll let you know when you have about two minutes left. Okay, awesome. You're at seven, okay, so seven and a half now. Okay, okay, good, <laughs> good, good. All right, so can you guys see my screen? I'm yeah. gonna make this. Yes. yes. Okay, awesome. So go, yes. <laughs> okay. Hopefully this loads. Maybe I shouldn't do it full screen. Okay, there we go. Am I frozen? Are we good? No, we can see it. Okay, great. So, uh, I just want to tell you guys quickly about the story of Corey. So like I said earlier, I have um, two more um, beautiful babies that I'll be introducing to you guys at the end. But the person that really changed my activism and my entire life was Corey. Um, so Corey was rescued from a live market uh, in Philadelphia in the summer of 2018. This is just a photo of that live market. Honestly, it's nothing special to all the other live markets that exist. I think in Philadelphia, we had about seven. Um, oh, sorry. I meant to say that the next photo, I'm gonna be showing some uh, distressing photos of chickens, FYI. So um, please look away if that is too much for you. This is a photo of the inside of, this, of the um, live market and just the rows and rows of cages. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with these hell holes. Uh, these are some pictures of all the activists that came out to this um, vigil that we had organized. Uh, so I had been living in Philly for not even three months at the time when this event happened, or sorry, uh, probably like six months. And this, we had already organized a couple of vigils at various um, live markets in the city, but this event in particular turned out to be one of our most popular event. We had over 200 people come. It was the most we would have ever seen. We had uh, press, we had like, it was just huge. Um, and yeah, this was when, this is a time a couple years ago when my, my, vision of activism and the way I saw myself being an activist was very much the stereotypical screen uh, image of like being on the streets with a sign protesting looking all badass. So that was 2018. These are some more photos of the activists that came. Um, it was a very successful event and another amazing part of this event that um, I think is worth mentioning was in addition to rescuing uh, two chickens. We also held a kind of funeral and um, a vigil for a chicken that was rescued a couple of weeks before and had passed away. And that was a really amazing event because we did a candlelight vigil and I had never seen people like at such a large scale gather around for like one individual. You know, we do these kinds of events thinking about all the individuals 
the unnumbered individuals that are harmed uh, because of animal agriculture, but for it to be for one specific individual, June, in this case, was really powerful. Um, so the reason why this event was so huge was not because of me being a really cool activist and doing amazing outreach, that too, but it was because we had this gentleman right here, Earthling Ed, fly all the way across the, the globe um, from England to come in and give a talk. He was on a tour in the United States and we, he wanted to come visit Philly. And at the time I was the only brown activist in my, one of the only brown activists in my entire circle. And basically it was decided that like, although we don't necessarily agree with his tactics and what he does and his like publicity, he will bring the publicity and he will bring the people. So we should have him and we should try to like use it to help our organization. Obviously now I don't necessarily agree with this, but um, yeah, this is the reason why we had so many people come to this event and it was so successful. The real reason why this event and this day was so important was because of this little individual that I met that day. So Corey wasn't necessarily the first chicken I had met and the first rescue I had been a part of, but she was the first chicken that I had decided to welcome into my home and to adopt. Um, Justin, I don't know how we are on time, but I wanted to show a quick video. It's three minutes long. Um, we're at about two and a half, so Okay, it's okay. I will skip past that video. But it was basically a cute video about all the activism I do with Corey. Um, I'm trying to think if we should do that or should I do the photos. Um, I'll just talk it out. Uh, yeah, so Corey was that amazing person that I met and that really changed my activism. After, before I had met Corey and I had adopted her, you know, I kind of had uh, the ego and the pride that a lot of animal activism activists have. And that is that I was a really, really cool activist myself. And everything changed when I met Corey. Every room Corey went to, every event she attended, every protest she went to, every veg fest she went to, she was a star. Like everyone just loved her so much, wanted to meet her, wanted to hang out with her. And like, I realized that, you know, my role had changed. My activism had changed. It had really gone from being at the streets with my sign, with my megaphone, being this like badass little teenager to my activism being feeding Corey blueberries, you know, and taking care of this person um, who had gone through such a traumatic life far more than I could ever imagine and that I really knew. And, you know, that was kind of my evolution of activism that came through her. I was going to show this video, but I can send you guys the link to it later. Uh, so yeah, Corey and I were living our best lives, being activists in Philadelphia. And then 2020 happened. Um, this is a photo of Corey and meeting Coretta, who is um, one of uh, Rocky's children. Um, in the beginning of the year of this year in January, it feels like decades ago, I uh, was making a trip to India. It was supposed to be a two month long trip to India. And I was actually um, taking some culinary courses to learn about, you know, my native roots and the cooking that we know and the spices that we have so much knowledge about um, to bring that knowledge back to start a food business. I I asked Corey, uh, sorry, not Corey. I asked Rocky at the time um, if she would mind watching Corey for two months while I did this trip. And she was gratefully, she graciously agreed to bring Corey into her home. And so this is a really cute photo of actually both the Corettas. Corey's long name is Coretta. So this is a photo of Corey, Coretta and Coretta meeting each other and then becoming like soul sisters, which was very, very beautiful. So winter chicken camp and what was supposed to turn into, what was supposed to be just two months away from Corey and me traveling to my motherlands, then turned into a pandemic and a three month long lockdown across the world. Um, I think this was probably the time when Justin texted me and asked me if I wanted to do a presentation about my activism with Corey. So it was a very, very hard time for me to be like, you know, what is my activism with Corey when I'm not even with Corey? Uh, so yeah, good times, good times. Um, 
I was reunited with Corey 205 days later, actually last month, literally in August. This is a photo of me. I, after being quarantined in Kentucky for a month, then driving all the way to Philadelphia to pack up my entire apartment and my entire life to then basically move back to Kentucky, I stopped by to pick up Corey. Um, and then a plot twist, um, I accidentally adopted two more chickens while I was there and I took them on a 12 hour hell ride, hell, hell, what am I trying to say? A 12 hour hell hole of a car ride across K to Kentucky, um, to live in my parents' basement where I would be unemployed and have no idea what I'm doing with my life. Um, so yeah, and this, and, and when I, when my dad uh, saw me pull up into a house, into my house with these two chickens and was like, um, what? I thought you had one chicken. How are there three now? Basically, all I could say was that Rocky had taken a picture of me holding these two babies and we saw a rainbow. So that was our sign. And this was my YOLO moment. Some people do retail therapy. I impulsively adopt two baby chickens. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, welcoming Bunty and Bubbly. These are their new names. Um, it's based off of a Bollywood movie that I really like. Um, was nothing but glamorous. It consisted of them staying in my shower for some time, to them staying in my closet for some time and sleeping in the closet, to then me doing a makeshift uh, coop and texting Rocky like every single day, freaking out about every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. And then somehow we made it to this place of harmony, um, some level of, of peace. Hey, man, um, we're just about over time, so whenever you want to. Okay, awesome. Last, this is the last slide, I believe. <laughs> so yeah, um, this is kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, I'm living in Kentucky. I've come back to the place uh, that I felt like there was so much violence towards animals that I had no idea how to be an activist at when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. And the universe said in 2020 that I am destined to be back here. So I really don't know what a queer brown animal loving vegan activist was doing being born in Kentucky, but you know, this is my next chapter. And in terms of the badass activism I'm working on right now, the greatest project I'm trying to do is leak proof diapers. And this is the revolutionary thing I'm working on. Um, so yeah, that's basically a summary of, uh, meeting Corey, uh, her changing my life, being an activist with her to then moving back to Kentucky and just honestly, uh, figuring out what's next and like going with the flow of how activism changes in life. Awesome. Thank you, Maika. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to mention a couple of people have been putting in the chat uh, some, ch some uh, messages, but they're only going to the panelists. So be sure if you want it to go to everyone that needs to be set on panelists and attendees, just a reminder for everyone, check your chat uh, uh, status there and make sure it's going to everyone. Uh, and also, there's been some requests for uh, media to follow for, for our panelists. So if panelists, if you want to put in any media, your Instagram, your, your Facebook, whatever, you would like people to connect with you, maybe put that in the chat as well uh, so they can connect with you further. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next panelist, and that is Rocky Schwartz. Rocky is a New York City-based rescuer, activist, and micro-sanctuary operator. She has worked at large animal sanctuaries, farm animal sanctuaries, since 2012, and she helped rescue nearly 4,000 animals throughout the United States over the past four years, specializing in chickens. She believes strongly in the power of sanctuaries to save lives, fight speciesism, and make activists better advocates for animals. And I'll actually give yet another little note to attendees. If you have questions, we will be opening up to questions after Rocky's presentation. So be sure to put your questions in the chat so we can chat about them. All right, Rocky Schwartz, thank you. 
Cool, thank you so much. Um, it's really, truly an honor to be presenting here today. Um, so many people I really, really look up to among the panelists. Um, so yeah, thank you for including me in this. Um, and I'm here today with Phoenix, who's actually a rescue from Kaporos, the ceremony that, or the ritual um, slaughter that Nora presented on earlier. Um, Phoenix was rescued back in 2017. Um, and actually uh, my rescued fish companion, Samantha, who is another Nora related rescue. Um, Nora hooked me up with Samantha after seeing her in uh, very confined and improper conditions. Um, so they're joining me today. Um, yeah, so um, to just give a little bit more information on, I guess, my background and how I came to the place where I am today, um, I was really, really lucky to be raised by parents who instilled a deep concern for other animals in me from a young age. Um, we were always the house on the block where if someone found an abandoned baby bird or a hurt squirrel, um, they would come to us. Um, I wouldn't say that my parents had any sort of kind of specialized knowledge about animal care, um, but they would intervene and get whoever needed help to the appropriate wildlife rehabber or shelter. Um, and it really was, I guess, a sentiment that was instilled very deeply in me from an early age that if you see someone in need, you should act. Um, if it was you, you would want whoever was coming across you while you were struggling or suffering to intervene. And so whether, you know, it's a worm on a sidewalk at risk of drying up um, or, you know, down the line, a chicken, um, you should take action. Um, at a about age eight or nine, that translated into me going vegetarian. Um, actually, when I saw the whole bodies of chickens being roasted in uh, the fast food restaurant Boston Market and started to make the connection that I was eating animals. Um, and at about 14, I went vegan when I started to learn more about the industry. Um, I didn't really know how to act at a young age. Um, the first protest I organized was actually at KFC um, the summer before my freshman year of high school. Um, I think I just saw a PETA advert about their Kentucky Fried Cruelty campaign um, and got a small group of friends together to go hold some signs. <laughs> outside of the restaurant. Um, so looking back, chickens have definitely been a big part of both my um, going vegan journey and then my activism journey from an early age. Um, when I was in college, I got more involved in, I guess, kind of more traditional activism. Um, so tabling for Mealless Mondays, leafleting, you know, just kind of general educational outreach. Um, and then the summer after my freshman year of college, I had the opportunity to intern and live at a larger farm sanctuary for the first time. Um, and that was when I think I really found one of my greatest passions, which is just educating people about these issues um, and doing that by introducing them to the survivors of the industry. Um, I think that you are able to really get people to think about industrial agriculture, um, or as uh, Justin spoke about in their presentation, even kind of the DIY, um, you know, homespun torture that animals are put through um, by introducing them to the survivors. Um, so, you know, in recent times, that looks like having folks over to the house and they will come up to Samantha's tank and Samantha is an extremely gregarious fish and she'll swim right over and look into their eyes with her big eyes um, and people will have that moment of connection and then it's a lot easier for them to start thinking about fishes as individuals. Um, when Phoenix comes over and just wants to burrow into your lap. Um, I think people start to see, oh, wow, you know, chickens are not these, you know, robotic, um, you know, fearful or aggressive or whatever the, you know, horrible stereotypes are. Um, whatever people might think, um, they start to see, okay, this is an individual um, and she has a very distinct personality from the other chickens in my rescued flock. Um, so, for a while, I was really, I guess, kind of going down kind of the traditional large scale farm sanctuary employee route um, with a lot of that focused on educational outreach and humane education, um, moved more into the animal care end of things because I was starting to realize that there is a lot that you just won't know about these animals until you are providing their daily care. Um, and for, I guess, kind of a few small examples of that, um, through my own chicken rehabilitation work in the past few years, I've really started to see that the way that we talk about chickens like Phoenix, and Phoenix is a Cornish cross, so the, the main breed of chickens um, raised for slaughter, 
she is the type of chicken you're going to see in any grocery store. Um, we talk a lot in our advocacy about how they are bred to grow so big so fast um, that they can't support their weight um, and just basically collapse under the weight of their own bodies. Um, one thing that I've learned just from my caregiving work is that although that can happen, um, more often than not when I'm rescuing young Cornish crosses and they have mobility issues, it's because we've bred them to have terrible immune systems and they've got terrible infections running through their bodies that are causing septic arthritis um, or just full on sepsis. Um, and so that's something that, you know, I think we can then talk about in our advocacy and bring more light to. Um, same thing with um, what Justin spoke about during their presentation about the realities of eggs and the impact that they have on chickens' bodies. Um, being able to talk about the experience of, you know, really loving a chicken and watching her you know, bloom upon rescue and then watching the horror of her succumbing to reproductive cancer um, that was the direct result of her egg laying um, and how that has inspired me today to make sure that all of the hens in my care um, are being given medication to prevent them from laying eggs. Um, that's something that will make people really understand why, you know, even the the eggs laid by their next door neighbor's happy backyard flock um, still have, you know, a death toll associated with them. Um, so all of this kind of through, I guess, kind of a series of life events um, and then a little bit strategy mixed in um, has led me to now having a micro sanctuary here in Brooklyn in New York City. Um, I'm very lucky to live in a brownstone, so a, a multi-bedroom kind of um, mini upright house um, with uh, several animal rights activists and vegans, um, so people who are very much on the same page as me, um, and my partner who is uh, an attorney who sues factory farms for a living, um, and basically run the micro sanctuary and a small rescue and adoption center out of our home, um, and find, I guess, kind of creative ways to hopefully tie that in with larger advocacy efforts. Um, so what that looks like basically is we are here in New York City where there are approximately close to 100 slaughterhouses in the five boroughs of New York City. So it's very, very concentrated. Um, when I am driving just a mile from my house, I will be passing by a slaughterhouse. Um, I would say probably a third of the time that I'm out driving through Brooklyn for longer than 10 minutes, I'll actually pass by a transport truck um, full of chicken crates and often live chickens on their way to a slaughterhouse. Um, so even though we're in an urban center and people don't really associate it um, with, you know, slaughter, with farming, um, it is very much happening here. And unfortunately, the options in terms of where, um, where chickens and other rescued farmed animals can go um, within the city are pretty limited. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, the municipal animal shelters here um, and wildlife rescues. Um, and then things beyond the city. Um, so I think I started to realize really that there is a strong need here. Um, sometimes that becomes very, very apparent. Um, so um, just about two weeks from now when we're going to be experiencing the Kaporos killings, um, that is a prime time um, for the past several years. What that's looked like here is sometimes up to 200 rescued chickens in our uh, kind of dingy unfinished Brooklyn basement um, who are then able to receive um, emergency veterinary care here. Um, um, and one of the great benefits of being in an urban setting is we often have access actually to better veterinarians for chickens than you would find in a rural setting. Um, because often when you're in a rural setting, your only option is the farm vet who's also, you know, at Farmer Joe's egg farm down the street. Um, whereas here in the city, we're able to access these really great boarded avian vets. Um, who are used to treating, you know, parrots and species where people are already kind of more accustomed to seeing them as individuals, providing them individual care, trying to give them long and healthy lives, um, and they're able to really transfer that knowledge very directly over to chicken care. Um, so I'm really, really lucky here to have access to a really great rescue-friendly vet who's just a phenomenal expert um, and has dealt with um, really a whole slew of chicken emergencies um, with me, um, sometimes at 3 a.m. Um, and and we see a lot of really wild situations here. So the Kaporos killings are one example. Um, often there will be birds who basically have bones sticking out from the area where their wings connect to their bodies because they're handled by their wings during the ritual. Um, and my vet has performed at this point probably over a dozen actually wing amputations on these birds, um, which they're able to live full, you know, totally normal, happy lives um, without wings because they're already not, not flighted. Um, 
with uh, the two birds who Mahika adopted from me, um, who were Buttercup and Bubbles when they were here, with a little Powerpuff Girls theme going with the names. Um, they were two among three survivors of a, a shipment of chicks um, who arrived at the chain store Tractor Supply, which is an agricultural store. Um, there were 63 chicks in this box. The box clearly, when shipped through just standard USPS mail, um, had experienced extreme temperature variations, and I actually believe crushing. Um, in the end, despite um, basically performing emergency triage care to the chicks who were still alive by the time they got here, um, right here in my living room. Um, only three actually ended up making it because they experienced so much harm at just literally a day old. Um, so uh, those two little hens, amazing birds and amazing survivors. Um, we will also see just escapees from the local live markets here. Um, and that will be everyone from little hens and roosters to guinea fowl, um, pigeons, quails, partridges, um, and being able to have someone local who, you know, knows how to give them an exam upon rescue, knows if they're going to need emergency vet care, um, can do just kind of big basics here in terms of, you know, painkillers and antibiotics and subcutaneous fluids. Um, that's something where, unfortunately, a, a lot of people in an urban setting um, aren't going to be comfortable handling a chicken to begin with um, and aren't really going to know what to look for. Um, and so part of what my advocacy has looked like also is trying to equip those who are interested locally in being able to um, better care for chickens. Um, some people in the activist circles here, I'd say probably maybe most, um, have actually never lived outside of New York City. They definitely have never, you know, worked full time at a larger farmed animal sanctuary. Um, and so being able to share that knowledge so that, you know, if they're thrown into a situation where they're, you know, at a protest at a slaughterhouse or whatever it might be, and suddenly they have a chicken in their arms, um, they'll be able to do just a, you know, a basic health check, know if they need to immediately bring them to a veterinarian or if that's something that, you know, can wait um, a day or two, um, that sort of thing. Um, just really help to also teach people about what you see with these birds um, because as I think we saw earlier today, there still are a lot of questions, you know, is there ever still a humane way to eat an egg or, you know, what, what is the deal with roosters? Um, just a lot of things that it makes sense that people wouldn't know if they've never had kind of hands-on interaction with these animals. Um, and I think also for a lot of activists in an urban setting, it's pretty easy to get, I guess, kind of disconnected and sometimes discouraged and even disinterested in their activism because they're so far removed from the act actual victims. Um, and if those only interactions look like you know, seeing the faces in the cages in the slaughterhouse. Um, I think it's just all the less incentivizing than, you know, being able to come spend a few hours at my house with Phoenix walking around and snuggling in your lap um, and really, you know, have that individual connection that people can draw from um, that A is hopefully going to keep them vegan um, and B is going to keep them standing up for these animals. Um, I know I'm probably running a little tight on time, so I guess one other thing that I would add with this is I think there is a pretty big disconnect in general um, in the animal movement um, between caregivers and rescuers and other advocates. Um, and I think if we're able to bridge that divide, we're going to get a whole lot more done and we're going to have way smarter campaigns. Um, so one example of this is just the veterinary records from the rescued Caporos birds over the years, being able to have years of that documenting the horrific cruelty the fecal parasites, other disease that these birds have experienced. Um, that's something that, you know, hopefully down the line could be used in, you know, Nora's legal work, for example, um, or in the legal work of my partner, um, being able to show exactly what these animals are going through um, from this caregiver and more medicinal perspective. Um, also, I think if, you know, we are able to bring in that specific care knowledge, so I guess there are a lot of opportunities for what this could look like, but you know, the example I gave before of the terrible immune systems of the Cornish crosses, um, or the reality of the, you know, just totally, totally life altering reproductive diseases of hens in the egg industry. Um, that's something that I think all advocates should know about. Um, and, you know, we might have less of a focus on getting hens out of cages and more of a focus on the effects of eggs as they, you know, totally ravage their bodies if that caregiver per, uh, perspective was more front and center um, in our advocacy work. Um, so those are just a few examples there. Um, but I think if we're able to be caregivers for these animals, um, even if it's just, you know, one or two chickens in your home or, you know, one amazing fish like Samantha in your home, um, which hopefully is uh, just as accessible um, as, you know, one or two cats or dogs in a home. Um, we're able to bring them in, 
bring other people in when they meet them, have them be more front and center in our advocacy work and thereby be better advocates for, um, you know, these underspoken for individuals. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Rocky. That's wonderful. I, I love seeing Samantha floating in the back. <laughs> so awesome. Okay, wow, we have an incredible panel. We really do. Um, these three amazing individuals are rocking it. And, and so it's so wonderful for me being in it for 30 years to see these young people energized and excited about not only veganism, but specifically chickens and knowing that that is so, so important to our advocacy. So thank you all so much. Uh, so if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat. I actually got an email. Justin, did you want to say anything before I get into a question? Because I got an email from someone whose chat isn't working that had a, a thought. So okay. Um, no, I just, you know, I mean, I, I gushed uh, at the beginning. So, um, but <laughs> after, watching, <laughs> after watching the presentations, it's, you know, it's it just drives home like how much uh, really cool work is being done by um, activists um, who are bringing together kind of big picture activism with like on the ground, hands on uh, uh, activism that includes both rescue, but also kind of empowering non humans to, to be activists as well and to do, you know, to make the change and to do um, the, the work uh, you know, basically speaking for themselves. A lot of times I think they make their own cases. Um, and uh, uh, kudos to Rocky for really uh, pushing the micro sanctuary ethos there. Good job. Um, <laughs> uh, Mahika too. Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for everybody who, uh, who spoke about the panel. Right, awesome. Oh, so there are a couple questions that came in on the chat. So maybe we should go with those so because these folks are here and uh, I mean that the email person might be here too, but uh, so uh, we'll, we can get to the email one too. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, so there, I think there was one for Rocky. How do you support the Cornish's immune system? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I would say with a lot of this, a lot of it really is going to be the combination of the bad immune systems with the farm settings that they're coming from. Um, so a lot of it often just looks like, you know, initial care, initial treatment for parasites, um, and initial antibiotics to deal with what they're coming in with. Um, and then beyond that, recognizing that um, whether it's the Cornishes with their large size or, you know, whatever it might be with different breeds, really knowing what to look out for. Um, so the Cornishes, um, one example of this is that they've got worse circulation than other chicken breeds do. So they're more susceptible to extreme temperatures, whether that's, you know, freezing temps or extreme heat. Um, so making sure that they're in, you know, appropriately temperature controlled environments, um, things of that sort. Um, and then also just, you know, being able to know them as individuals so that if they start to look a little bit off, you're going to pick it up faster um, because as I imagine was mentioned earlier today, um, chickens are prey animals and that means that they're going to be really good at hiding it when they're not feeling good um, until they're at a point where they can't anymore. Um, I also did realize that I, I should have mentioned and didn't. Um, if anyone is interested in adopting any chickens, um, Kaporos will be a big ad adoption opportunity that's coming up in just a few weeks. Um, and in general, I um, think uh, any, any one of us who spoke today could probably plug you into um, really international chicken adoption networks. Um, and I believe someone shared earlier the link to the Vegans with Chickens Facebook page, um, which I'm happy to be one of the administrators of and is a really great resource for both finding um, chicken care information and also chickens in need of homes. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so I think I am gonna do the email question. It's specifically for Mahika, and it's, this person said, it was basically just kind of like chicken diapers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what this has to do with is something that I'd love you to talk about, which is that you take your, is it, I'm already forgetting, Corey? Corey to yeah. events, right? You bring uh, Corey to events with you to introduce people to chickens. And I think maybe this is where the diapers come in, if I'm not, uh, if, if I'm, I'm pretty sure. So why don't you tell us about, a little about that? Yes, wow, my favorite topic, chicken diapers. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, 
for anyone and everyone that has baby fever and like wants a human baby but doesn't want a human baby and like wants to change diapers adopt a chicken and keep them in your home it's great fix for that um so yeah weirdly enough chicken diapers are a thing i had a really really cute video that i wanted to show you guys i posted it um in the chat and i guess i can share it on my social media but it was like it was basically a story of like corey's life in philadelphia like you know and it, it talked about the diapers and basically chickens poop a lot like <laughs> Like five out of ten times, like anything I'm posting in Vegans with Chickens is about chicken poop. Mahika, you're giving away the secrets. We're not supposed to tell people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all I was saying. Um, chicken diapers are really great for if you want to keep your uh, chickens indoor, which Corey, um, when she was living in Philly with me and kind of right now, she is indoor like 90% of the time and only outside for like a couple hours a day. Um, partly because of like safety reasons, partly because, um, you know, I have a, a senior dog and it's me and we just kind of had our own little posse and she just wanted to be around us all the time. So it kind of worked. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, I, it's, it's in a re it's a reusable diaper. You can kind of adjust the straps. They go around the wings and, uh, strap around the back. There's a bunch of different kinds. Um, it's a whole, it's a whole industry. <laughs> um, and yeah, basically you just, um, I change my diapers once or twice a day, kind of depends on your person. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to remember what the second part of it was. Oh yeah, taking her to events. Yeah. Right, yeah, so uh, Corey was, was and is a really cool little activist that just got invited to like all sorts of events. Um, I think, one of the reasons why Corey really became such a like famous person in in the community was because um, at the time I only had one adopted chicken, so my time and my abilities to do online social media and my presence, um, my abilities that were more. So uh, Corey has an Instagram page, and like you know, we used to share memes, and we used to like it was it was told from the perspective of her, which was really cool, and. Um, very, very quickly on, I realized, and I, nowadays I don't really call myself an animal rights activist. I call myself Corey's mom or her momager, honestly. Um, I would get calls, like just random calls of a friend from actually Chicago, one Corey to speak at the Midwest March for Animals, I believe last year. And so we road trip to Chicago. Corey's been to Chicago. She's been to Atlanta. She's been to Kentucky several times. And like, yeah, that diaper makes traveling really easy. You know, you just kind of pop her on and she's ready to go wherever. Um, I think that, yeah, so Rocky just posted Corey's page. It's, uh, Corey lives on Instagram. I'm not very active on it right now, but I plan to be active soon. Uh, but yeah, that really helps with mobility and, um, she's been to veg fest. She's spoken at, spoken at, uh, different marches. I randomly would get calls. There was a a drag queen that wanted to do a story time and read a story about like uh, chickens and wanted to do a photo shoot with Corey. Um, she was like, uh, there was a photographer in Canada that wanted to come one weekend last year and take photos with Corey for her book. So like, she's just overall a very cool person and I'm very honored to be her parental unit. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, one quick, what brand of, di of diapers do you recommend? Just um, I'm going to, uh, pass this on to my lovely friend, Cor uh, why am I saying Corey? <laughs> Corey, can you tell me this answer? Rocky. Um, I think the diapers definitely depends on the, the breed of the chicken because I have the diapers that I was using for Corey do not at all work for Bunty Bubbly who are Cornishes and a complete other game. Rocky. Please. Yeah, um, I believe that she's on a production hiatus, but Jenny Ray of Rooster House Rescue in um, the Seattle area has the brand Chicken Knickers, um, and that's what Phoenix is actually wearing. I don't know if she'll let me show you. 
right now. Um, very cute diapers. Um, there are a few other brands out there. And honestly, if you just Google chicken diapers, you will see, as Mexico was saying, an entire industry of chicken diapers. Um, I previously used the brand Crazy K, um, which isn't my favorite just in terms of the fact of, that they sell other not so animal friendly products on their site, um, but they do have diapers that have a liner that you can remove and are really good for, I guess, uh, heavier birds and heavier poop loads. <laughs> Justin, you have a question? Yeah, I've um, got a question from the audience. Um, uh, Jake asked, do you have any specific steps um, or ways that you use technology and marketing to mobilize people and build a community of activists? Um, so basically just kind of asking uh, ways that you all use technology in, in your activism to, you know, kind of get people motivated. Who wants to take it? Julia, we haven't heard from you. Is she still on? There she is. Yeah. I'm on, but we don't actually usually have time for that. Um, in general, like we are getting multiple oopsie roo requests a week. We are getting, you know, multiple dumped rooster requests a week. And so Ooh. our various members are usually focused on that direct rescue effort and we really don't have time for a lot much else. Um, so I don't know. I think everybody else is probably better suited to answer that. Well, Julia, can I ask real quick, um, for people who would are interested in your area, are interested in getting involved with uh, Chicago Roo Crew, um, like what's the easiest way to get in touch with you all? So yeah, with us, like our Facebook presence is probably the best way, you know, like messages on Facebook. Um, if you want to help, if you have any desire to adopt a rooster, like come to us because we have really great ones and they're so awesome. They're so great. Like they're all foster. We have rooster flocks who are already integrated. Like you can, you can get the best, amazing, most awesome birds. Um, but yeah, you know, like if you want to contribute, like we are grassroots, totally grassroots. So like we don't have, like if you want to help, all of us are paying out of pocket, our own pockets to save these birds. So, you know, the only way to contribute really is call Niles Animal Hospital and, you know, give them some money. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is desperate times here in Chicago. Like we're getting three to five birds a week. Uh, it's bad. So yeah, that's the best way really. Thanks, Julia. Yeah. So uh, Rocky or Mejica, anything about uh, the original question uh, of, of outreach and using technology? I like to ask this to young people personally. So. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that Corey has an Instagram page. That really was a great way to uh, bring a lot of people together. Uh, Rocky also has a really amazing Instagram page that I'm sure she'll talk about in a sec. But um, yeah, I have some plans of working on a, a documentary movie about Corey, actually, just kind of putting together her whole life story. And yeah, youngsters, like tech, we're on our phones all the time. Like that social media is where we are at, you know? So I really, uh, since I, again, like I said, like I was in a place where I only had one chicken child. So like the free time you have with one chicken child versus like three and then beyond, beyond that is very, very different. So I did have the time to do those kinds of things. Um, you know, you don't really see a lot of chickens with Instagram pages. Um, and I actually uh, did a little research about animals with, with Instagram pages. Half of them I didn't even like. Like half of them, half of the fame, there's a couple of famous roosters and chickens on Instagram and they're like, their message is like, it's not like, you know, total liberation like Corey. So I've definitely like even, I've explored the other, the other chickens out there. You know, we follow a couple of them, but like, 
yeah, um, that's, that's a really cool place too, to, you know, do some activism for sure. Especially when it's like from, when you can make content, um, from the perspective of animals in a way that's respectful, uh, which I try to do. And I try to do it from first person perspective on Instagram. I think that's, that's really cool. Awesome. Yeah. And with, um, with technology, I would say, um, use it in a few different ways. So um, I think my kind of initial foray into chicken oriented technology was really through the Vegans with Chickens Facebook group, um, which I feel like I talk about it a lot, but it's just such a tremendous resource, um, especially with all of the misinformation coming from the industry and coming from backyard chicken keepers online. Um, I think that can be one of the hardest obstacles in chicken advocacy and chicken care, just finding solid information that's actually oriented toward, you know, the animal's perspective. Um, so um, I think that's part of it, just having the information you need in your advocacy and your caregiving. Um, then from my perspective too, um, because I end up, I guess, overseeing placement for a lot of large scale rescue efforts. Um, I use technology pretty heavily to connect with potential adopters um, and get a sense of who they are and if they would be a safe home for rescued birds, whether it's ones who I have an immediate placement need for or potentially, you know, months ahead um, if there are kind of these kind of more timed rescue opportunities like Kaporos. Um, so um, it can be a really great way to just kind of use technology to network so that, um, you know, as Julia was saying, there's such a need. Um, so if there are, you know, people you know who you maybe see in some sort of local Facebook group and they seem like maybe they'd be an amazing potential rooster adopter and they're only two hours from Chicago, um, might be able to kind of route them in the direction of those who you know are looking for homes. Um, and then in terms of, I guess, kind of more of the general public educational outreach, um, over the years, I guess I've kind of pursued this to varying degrees and we've actually had a lot of really great success um, with this. So um, we've had some coverage of our little crew here and specifically um, another of my Kaporos rescues, Rose, who just uh, celebrated her fourth birthday last weekend. Um, she was featured on the Dodo um, and she had a really really amazing, strong friendship with my senior Chihuahua Biscuit, who passed away last year. Um, and so their friendship, which I think also kind of served as a good outreach um, opportunity because people already connect with dogs and seeing a dog connect with a chicken maybe helps people connect with chickens. Um, they were actually featured on a little uh, TV segment that aired on Animal Planet Canada. Um, and then I should know this, I wanna say CNN here in the US. Um, so um, I had actually a lot of strangers internationally reaching out to me saying that they saw the segment and were really impacted by it and um, impacted by you know getting to see Rose as a chicken living in a house in New York City and clearly having a personality. Um, so I think with this, um, if you have chickens in your care, it's just really great even to reach out to your local newspaper. Um, there are so many you know horrendous stories, whether it's about you know a new chicken wing restaurant um, or as was mentioned before these articles about like oh now you can keep chickens in the city um, and they're just very um, oriented toward the the human gain from chickens so if we're able to just do outreach and say oh yeah like this is either a, a chicken activist or a chicken sanctuary um, and here's one chicken um, maybe rescued locally who you can get your local paper to cover um, I think that can you know sometimes have even a bigger impact than you know shooting for more national media. Great. So I just want to give a little time check to everybody. We are, of course, over time, but since it's the last thing we have today and it's such an incredible panel and there's still so much interest in the chat, I think we're just going to keep going if that's okay with everyone and with the panel. Uh, we'll go for maybe like 15 more minutes. And then we do have that last segment of Mary's to show, the last 15, minute of, 15 minutes of Mary's presentation that we will show at the very, very end. So about maybe 15 more minutes and then we'll show uh, the last of Mary. So just wanted to say that. And then, so in the chat, there was a couple of questions about hormonal implants. And so uh, if I can't find a vet who will do hormonal implants, are there other legal hormonal medications? And then there was a follow-up question that said, uh, I understand there are great benefits using super loin implants uh, to help keep chickens healthy, the downside, as I see it would be how the hormones affect and hurt the environment and other living beings. How do you deal with this dilemma? So hormones. <laughs> Who wants to take I, it? 
I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I can, if, uh, if Mahika and Julia don't want to. <laughs> yeah, so we, we need it. <laughs> sure. Okay. So um, just to kind of give like an overview with this, um, as I imagine everyone has a sense of from everything that's been discussed today, um, especially if you're looking at rescues from the egg industry, they're going to be laying approximately 300 to 350 eggs a year versus their natural dozen. Um, that's going to wreak havoc on their bodies. Um, and I would say in the case of a lot of birds rescued from the egg industry, they might even be dead before their first rescue anniversary um, from egg caused conditions from cancer to impact. Um, in my own sanctuary life, prior to having chickens in my own direct care, I saw so many birds die from reproductive related conditions. Um, and as someone who then committed to ensuring that none of the hens in my care would be laying eggs, um, the superlaurin or dislaurilin implant, that's kind of two different names for the same thing, um, was something that has been a just tremendous tool for me with that. Um, there has been a lot of pushback that I hear that it's unnatural to give chickens this hormone. Um, and some of that I think is just kind of a general maybe um, rejection of Western medicine. Um, and what I would say with that is this is something that overwhelmingly is going to extend their lives and make their lives more comfortable um, because the difference between a hen who is laying an egg every day and going through that arduous process um, and a hen who whose body doesn't have to be, you know, spending so much energy on that, um, it's just night and day. Um, so I would say it's truly life-saving and quality of life improving in ways that are just hard to describe unless you've seen it firsthand. Um, beyond that, I'd say that the, <laughs> the process of laying an egg a day is so far from what their bodies naturally should be doing. So even if it seems unnatural to be giving them a hormone, that hormone is basically just counteracting this extremely unnatural thing and returning their body to what is more of a natural state. Um, in terms of the effects of a hormone in their body getting out of their body. I will be honest and say, I don't have a, a great sense of what that looks like, um, but I can't imagine that it is any worse than what's already um, being emitted by humans. Um, you know, there will be articles about antidepressants ending up in our sewage systems and all sorts of things. Um, and with this, I, I can't imagine that the effects of, you know, even, even thousands of hens receiving this implant are going to have some sort of, you know, extremely deleterious environmental impact. Um, and again, just the, the effects for them, um, in, in my eyes, unless something is going to be just totally world shattering, um, if it's going to improve the lives of those in my care, um, and there's kind of this more abstract negative impact from it um, that is hard to quantify, um, I'm going to do what I can to do right by them. Um, if you don't have access to a vet who is providing the implant, um, definitely reach out. We might be able to help you find a vet who is willing. Um, there are a few other options. There are um, some injections that the efficacy of them, I'd say, in general, not as strong as the Desloralin implant, um, but they can be good as a backup or a short-term solution. Um, and we can provide you with more information on that. And there's a lot of great information um, on the Vegans with Chickens page um, and potentially also through the Open Sanctuary Project. Um, I'm not sure offhand if they've got a lot of information on the alternatives, um, but um, yep, there's uh, so many of us who are just <laughs> totally happy to talk about this for even hours on end. Um, so just uh, connect and um, as I think some people are testing to in the chat, uh, the, the implant truly just is a, a total game changer for hen care. Definitely. Yeah, no, they're, they're amazing. So uh, definitely a good plug for vegans with chickens for anybody who's interested. <clears throat> um, so uh, we're getting kind of towards the end of the time here. So um, I wanted to maybe ask a wrap up question um, to if each of the panelists could just um, to chime in. So um, for each of you, what, what would you say would be like if you were going to tell somebody one thing who has no experience with chickens, no experience for doing chicken activism, like what would be one concrete thing that they could do to maybe get started on becoming an activist for, um, for chickens, you know, whatever that activism means? Uh, am yeah. I here? Go ahead and start. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, um, I might need to un- oh, okay. <laughs> so Julia, did you want to start and answer the question? Um, what I would say is that um, I grew up with large parrots. Um, I grew up with... Come 
how you know, can't see you. If, if, yeah, I don't know how this works at this point. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, there, there's some all, all kinds of like tech weirdness going on. But what I can say is I grew up with very large parrots who are supposed to be, you know, incredibly intelligent, inc including African greys, you know, macaws, um, Amazons, you know, I wasn't able to keep large parrots for quite a long period of time. And then I got into chickens. They don't have, there is no distinction. Chickens are as intelligent as those birds. They are amazing. They are absolutely incredible. They have all the ability to connect with people, with them, you know, other animals. Um, they are absolutely like the best birds and they're so accessible and I don't know, you know, like from my perspective as somebody who is a large parrot rescuer as well as a chicken, you know, rescuer, I'm unclear on why people choose to buy for thousands of dollars birds who belong in the wild. Um, instead of adopting, you know, a chicken who is just as smart, just as clever, just as awesome, just as good a companion. Like, why not just adopt a chicken? Um, and especially a rooster. Because, you know, the roosters, I love my hens, but like, my roosters are always like my heart. Uh, they're absolutely the best in the world. You can't, you can't ever get a better friend than a rooster who loves you and is devoted to you and your friends. So I don't know, like the only thing I can say to end this and my part in this is just contact your rescue groups locally who have chickens and especially roosters and consider having a house rooster because they're the best. <laughs> like way better than a dog like the best animal companion that you could have they're loyal awesome loving um so do that and then yeah listen to everybody else on the care um consider them to be a companion animal awesome house roosters yes <laughs> wonderful all right who else would like to wrap it up? Rocky, do you want to go? Or should I go? Uh, either order. <laughs> okay, I'll just go really quickly. Um, oh my gosh, that's a hard wrap up question. I'm just trying to think of what to say. But um, I guess I just want to give a huge, huge shout out to the micro sanctuary movement. Um, I'm so grateful to reach to the point where I have connected with this great um, resource. Uh, group and to be a part of helping them and you know they're helping me they've helped me so much um i can't tell you all the different types of just weird activism i have tried in my youth and honestly out of all the things i have done out of the presentations the pamphlets the the nasty messages i have written on like egg cartons at my parents houses like just all the stickers i posted just all the things i have done to just piss people off um the thing that really i feel like has been the most transformative and like just caused the most change is corey and i tell a lot of people this that they're they're isn't anything I can say that Corey can't say and do and show and like poop and fly better than me. And like, you know what, my advice, what you should do for, to like get involved in this is just somehow somewhere, find a way to feed a chicken a blueberry, just feed them a blueberry and just spend time with them. And, you know, view this not as, 
some like chickens belonging in this like very secluded place you know rocky was talking about being in new york city and like she has a whole like chicken camp paradise you know like Corey was pissed at me when i picked her up and was like let's go kid we're going she was having her best life there like these 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 beings are everywhere and i think meeting a chicken is like a really really good great place to start and then secondly you know like earlier on when I was younger as an activist, Rocky kind of talked about this, the kind of disconnect between in the activism community from caregivers and rescuers and other animal rights activists. I was very, very disconnected from the caregiving side. And I really um, had this glamorized, glorified vision of what it meant to be an activist. And I kind of also had this mentality where I was like, oh, you know, like, numbers wise, like maybe there's something I could be doing like to help more animals, like policy work, like, like active, like vigils, like protests that would like, or like education that would help more people than maybe just the couple of animals I could help with caregiving. But in reality, that, that mentality is so wrong because, um, as a caregiver, it's not just me like taking care of this one person and helping them have the best life that they can. It's like, amplifying their voice you know and just sharing their photos and sharing their voices and just my last quick thing about the whole thing with um implants and implanting chickens um there's so many things you learn on this journey of being a chicken parent that you would never think about you know we have these facts and these figures of like what it's like to be a chicken in this situation but like when they are like they're at your doorstep and like they have a half cut beak and they lay eggs every single day and they have so many things like you didn't even think about then all of a sudden you have to think about these needs and in terms of for specifically Corey and her implant story I didn't start implanting her until like six months after rescuing her. And so for six months, every single day, she was laying an egg and she was screaming in pain to the point where like, I was completely used to that. I was used to those 20 or 30 minutes. We had a routine. I took care of her. I comforted her. I did what I could. And then we implanted her and all of that went away. And then, you know, implants wear off and you have to keep renewing them, which is like, I think the cost of them is one of the the, the biggest struggles, you know, that's why I shout out to micro sanctuary grants. Those are amazing things that you should apply to. They are lifesavers for me. Um, like in between when an implant a couple of years ago, an implant was like, you know, low or like fading off or whatever the word is she had an episode where she was laying an egg and she was screaming so much and like just the normal everyday egg laying thing was happening and because i had not heard her scream and i hadn't gone through that for six months seven months however long i had forgotten what it was like and i cannot tell you how much i'm literally getting goosebumps it freaked me out so much and i could feel that pain and i was so concerned at a completely different level because when it's going on every single day and that's just their life you just accept that as their reality and you can't even fathom or imagine a life where like they don't have that pain because like who is this person without this this like trauma and this pain and that suffering and then to see what it's like without it and then get a glimpse of what it's like with like you're you're shocked and it reminds you how important these these like technology and this medicine and these like beautiful things that we have access to that like some of us have access to that like we should use you know so yeah that's my closing thoughts thank you guys so much thank you Mahika. so Rob, a, brief, a brief wrap up <laughs> yeah um, i just want to say i agree with everything that Julia and Mahika said. Um, and I know that um, probably most of the attendees have some interest in this area to begin with. And a lot of people have a lot of experience in this area. So I would say, um, you know, if you're someone who's already an advocate, um, even if you're someone who already works at a big sanctuary, consider adopting even just one chicken as your own companion. Um, because in my own experience, the difference between, you know, being around a flock in a large sanctuary setting and having, you know, Phoenix next to me here on the couch, um, it's really, it just completely changes how you see them. Um, if um, if you are already you know supporting chicken rescue and chicken care, um, definitely consider supporting people like Julia and Mahika who are you know kind of doing the extra hard work of 
you know, running micro sanctuaries of color. Um, I think that's something that I was just thinking about and it got kind of emotional during Julia's presentation, hearing about um, the man who adopted one of the cockfighting survivors. Um, I think that, you know, as a movement in general, we've done a really terrible job reaching communities of color. And that's something that, you know, micro sanctuaries really have the power to do as well. Um, and so, you know, supporting the people who are already doing the hard work there um, is something that, you know, we all should be doing within the movement in order to a, just, you know, support human justice um, and also support um, the animals and, you know, having the, the cause of animal rights um, reach everyone. Um, and then I would just say also, um, talk about chickens, <laughs> um, talk about them every chance you get. Um, if someone is, you know, making some offhand remark, whether it's, you know, calling someone they dislike a bird brain, um, or even, you know, maybe the uncomfortable moment where you're on public transit and someone's eating a hard boiled egg next to you, um, which might be more, uh, I guess, a, a pre-COVID <laughs> um, phenomenon. Um, but yeah, just bring it up. It doesn't have to be adversarial. It can just be, you know, talking about if you don't have personal experience, talking about what you heard here today, um, talking about what Mahika was just describing about Corey and how you heard this presentation, um, really just getting it front and center. Um, and I'd say if you're already doing all of these things, um, maybe start doing it for fishes too. <laughs> um, because um, I, hopefully we're standing up for the, the most abused land animals. And then um, as we're doing that, hopefully we start standing up for aquatic animals as well, um, who are also you know overwhelmingly left out of the picture. Um, I sometimes call fishes the, the chickens of the water. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I think just uh, stand up for them um, because they're the, the victims who are going unseen. So, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, beautiful. Wow, incredible panel. Thank you all three so much. Uh, it's so inspiring. I, I, you know, I feel, I feel like the future is in good hands <laughs> with these awesome young activists. Thank you all so much. Uh, I know that Justin has to go soon because he has got roosters to take care of. So, um, yeah. so Justin. <laughs> Do you want to say any final words and we'll wrap yeah. up? Yeah, so but yeah, so we, we are still going to air the um, last bit of Mary's uh, presentation video um, if anybody wants to stick around, but I do need to sign off um, as a bedtime duties call. But uh, yeah, no, wow. Uh, we made it through the first ever chicken webinar ever. That's pretty awesome. Thanks to everybody who participated and attended. Um, I can't tell you how much this means to, to us. Um, I know it means a lot to Hope. I know it means a lot to all the, the panelists here um, just to see how much of an awareness is growing around chickens and, and even just the interest. Um, because it's, it's not a joke um, to say that, you know, the chickens are, are dismissed more so than, than any other uh, animal in, um, you know, farming industry. Um, it's, it's very true. And, and unfortunately, vegans are, are um, uh, guilty of that as well because we inherit all of these uh, you know, assumptions and, and, and views on different animals, um, you know, from our, our culture. And so, uh, you know, as someone who loves chickens and who spends my life uh, caring for chickens, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to see um, more and more interest growing um, in caring for them and advocating for them and, and, you know, doing activism both for them and with them. So, yeah, thank you everybody. And again, like, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, our sanctuary is Triangle Chicken Advocates. We're on Facebook. Um, I'm also on Facebook and I, I did put my email address in the chat um, earlier on. So I'm happy to answer questions. Great, and thank you, Justin, for all your hard work on this. He is.